I have some highlights from it. I took my these are my iPhone shots from the conference. If you could could you see these here? These coming. Well, I saw them on on the phone yeah. while I was traveling, so okay. that wasn't really <laughs> yeah, helpful. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's Heather, Heather with uh, Anthony Peratt. And uh, this is my, 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 my little travel travel log of the of the thing. So here are some shots from it. This is the intro to it. But yeah, it's not bad for you know an iPhone stuff. So so we can <laughs> walk through your presentation. I don't know if you want to do that, but <laughs> I, got, I got a lot of it. Well, we might do that sometime. Said sometime. Later. Yeah, 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 yeah. But just, just, to, uh, but just a quick uh, scan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should say that uh, I wouldn't be uh, available on Sunday because my band is having a concert. Oh, nice. Right, All right. Right at that time. So. Oh, cool. No okay. chance. Yeah. Okay. Where, where, where are you playing? What's the venue? That's one of our local clubs, mm -hmm. like, like a rock bar, something like that, you know. Okay, fun, fun. So, uh, let's see. Any, I mean, we could walk through the conference if you want, just with ideas that came up. And, uh, you know, and... Of course, uh, Michael Claridge spoke right after Eugene, so this is some of his presentation ideas. Well, did I he, can did say he that... Talk at, did he talk at all about Sapphire, or was it more uh, general? What's your read, Eugene, on this? Well, he only mentioned it near the end, and he didn't really talk about it much. He only gave a couple of teasers, like uh, he said that they have an idea how, you know, these fast radio bursts might happen during the breakdown of plasma double layers. So that was probably the most, you know, interesting uh, new thing uh, in terms of Sapphire. Right. This looks familiar, James. <laughs> That's something you were doing there, right? Yeah, it looks like your axial radial flow. Right, right. James has a great, great model this that he's done on, on the uh, uh, for the uh, eth ethereal matters website. Yeah, but that's a, this is basically the, the same thing. Yeah, that Don yeah. Scott did. Right, right. I mean, he 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 actually references the same papers that I do in my presentation. All right. And, and even some of the pictures are the same. Yeah. So there was a, an interesting point that he made about the spacing of planets, how, uh, you know, in this Birkeland current, uh, I mean, as, as analyzed by Don Scott, there should be pretty much equal spacings uh, between these, you know, maxima of, of, of this function of, say, current density or magnetic field strength. But in our system, we observe more of a logarithmic uh, spacing, and in the, which means you know, not linear. So, for example, the next each next planet is roughly two times farther than the previous one, but but not exactly, but some somewhere along that line. So they're not equally spaced, and what he found is that uh, exoplanetary systems are also seem to follow that kind of logarithmic law, even though with different powers. So you can see these slopes are different uh, when, when he takes the logarithm graph. But uh, one interesting thing, and I've discussed this with him later at our sort of Q&A panel, but it wasn't actually a Q&A panel, it was just a lunch <laughs> where, you know, random people would speak to us. So. Uh, he has found, as far as I understood, that the uh, it's not exactly two to the power of one, you know. So that the the distances do not exactly double, but slightly less than that. So it's two to the power of uh, something like zero point eighty six or something like that. Uh, 
and I've remembered that uh, previously I've had a uh, conversation with him. Uh, so I, I was asking him a question, why is the solar wind, you know, behaving in the way it does? And in particular, I was asking him that uh, the solar wind density changes not as one over R squared, as you know, would be expected for, well, for example, the, you know, solar uh, radiation changes like that, like one over R squared, just from, you know, purely geometrical considerations. But the solar wind density changes uh, kind of slightly slower. So you you see more dense wind outwards than uh kind of would be expected, I guess. And uh, as far as I'm aware, it's explained by magnetic fields and, you know, MHD stuff. But whatever, the, the, the most interesting point is that there's this power, 1 over R to the power of 1.86. And this 86 part is, you know, almost the same as he has in his planetary spacing thing, where he has 2 to the power of 0 0.86. So maybe maybe there's there is some you know uh co connection maybe it's, maybe the solar wind is uh directly related to the planetary spacing that's what i'm saying basically well wait a minute because i mean i thought in his model and in his talk the spacing of the planets is the <clears throat> is related to the Bessel function itself it's you know the I don't know, not necessarily the zeros of the vessel function, but the where the uh, certain of the zeros where the slope is going the right direction. Do you okay. mean Scott's model? Yeah. Well, and Scott maybe. was also Scott was also quoting another gentleman who uh, who came across the same results as him uh, by mapping out the planets to the vessel function. Um, I forgot to write his name down, but I need to cite that. Yeah, he doesn't claim total originality for his model. It's like he he refined it or made it precise or made it exact or something. But he, but, but Scott gave someone else credit for um, for originating in some sense. Well, I certainly give him credit for popularizing the Birkeland current model again. Well, I'm I'm just basically repeating what Michael said, that, you know, the, the, the Bessel function, maxima and minima are equally spaced and planets are not. So if they are related, right. then in some, in some, something else should be involved at least. Yeah. That's a scalar thing that, you know, that's, this is the one over R stuff that I see pretty loudly. It's actually one over, you know, R to the one half with a constant. You know, huh. we see it pretty loudly here but and this is actually, a good start this is a good start to the model though i mean it's just just you know to me to me yeah. it's just take this and then and then and then have a have a you know you, you scale the, you scale the wavelength as a, you know as a like a one over r type of thing yeah and i mean to, to me it's kind of uh i think it might be related to you know these problems of uh like dark matter and things like that where you know, gravity seems to, I mean, whatever the attraction force is, seems to fall off in a different manner, let's say, than one over R squared. So since solar wind already does that, it, it doesn't fall off like one over R squared, but, but rather s slower than maybe it is, you know, related even to the galactic scale processes, something like that. Mm -hmm. This this one image has been playing me. It was on one of uh, uh, Wall's Space News, Space Newses. But uh, let's see if I can find it here. It's bubbling around. Yeah, this one. I mean, with the uh, trans-Neptunian objects. Do you think this is fairly accurate? This uh, little graphic here. Well, I don't exactly know what it's depicted here. So yeah, well, it's the it's the it's the objects that we track that are outside of the solar system. You know, the the, the, the orbits of them. This would be. Well, maybe. See it there. 
Maybe. We just see the action that starts happening here. Start. But what is this Buffy's orbit? Yeah. Because <laughs> there Buffy's was vampire slayer. There was this. There was this Buffy star, right? The, the one that kind of changes its brightness in some mysterious fashion. Okay. Do you remember? You probably remember there was this story that, or maybe it's alien megastructure around the star or something. Or, or maybe it was a comet swarm around the star and so on. I think it was called Buffy. I mean, kind of Buffy star or something like that. Mm -hmm. I just think there's a lot. There's a lot of. Uh, I mean, I, I I haven't spent time. I just ran into it fairly recently. But but the Lissage's pattern thing of it and the. Uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to kind of do a little bit of harmonic analysis on that. You know, if they're if in fact this far off the, you know, the 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 plane of the ecliptic, right? No, I, I completely screwed that up. It was Tabby Star. <laughs> oh, Tabby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, this was this was another one. Is, 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 do you know how accurate this is? I've I've seen this quoted, but I, I'm, I'm just wondering how tight it is. As far as well, I haven't looked into looked into it in, in detail, but I think it's fairly accurate. Yeah. yeah. That, that that relationship seems pretty strong. Yeah. I mean, I haven't looked the the, the actual uh, periods, but but I know that such resonance exists. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So uh, anyway, buddy, this one seems to have had a lot of play. We've enjoyed that one for sure. Let's see. Yeah, is that is that up to? Ten thousand shares or more? I don't know. It's really good though, right? <laughs> that's a that's a meme for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I think um, uh, actually I tagged Electric Universe Biology on there too, so it gets people thinking mm -hmm. when I shared it. Hey guys, Ramon, how's it going? In the chat. Yeah, oh, it's going pretty well. I'm just recovering. That's why my wife made me stay home. <laughs> oh no, okay. From uh, from the illness good. or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, had a meeting with a a kid from the UK campus, and they're gonna have me come and do the entrepreneur thing. But he was sick; he gave me some kind of campus ch uh, chest cold. So, anyways, uh, I, in the uh, chat, I posted something that from out of uh, one of my papers, a quote, and uh, not sure if that's where Eugene was going or not. But I'd love to hear his uh, response to to this. And I also can put up the. Uh, papers that Giordano was citing um, to do with this issue, if if that's necessary. And then I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> now we have to read it. <laughs> do you, can you can you go into a little bit more illustration on on what you're talking about here? Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. So he basically says that uh, the geometry should be different, or something like that. Yeah, he was talking about how we're going to account for. You know, obviously, they keep finding baryons, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, I had responded to his paper about looking for um, neutrino radiation in the early part of the. Uh, this is all Big Bang cosmology, obviously. And uh, he and I had sort of a conversation, and then by the time I got to the seventh paper, uh, this came up again. Uh, because the whole series is about where is the dark matter. Uh, this was something he had emailed me, and I hadn't seen that before. Um, and so the the I think the most important bit is the the yep. by factor four hundred percent. And I was really intrigued by uh, his explanation about the volume uh, might be might have something to do with it. So I didn't know if that. Would it play into factors to what Eugene was talking about? I came in the middle of that conversation, so <laughs> just thought I'd throw that up there. The the one thing I found kind of compelling that you mentioned, Eugene, was the uh, the, the the density. And maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but the density increases as you as as you go out. You're talking about density of a solar wind. 
No, it's just uh, it just doesn't decrease as doesn't fast. Decrease as, as fast. Okay. Uh, yeah, as it could be. I mean, if you just uh, consider the sun as just you know shooting uh, solar wind particles in all directions, kind of uniformly, and they just you know continue following that line, it should fall off as one over r squared. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Pretty much again as the energy density of the solar radiation itself. Right, right. Well, the thing is, though, it's not, it's not being ejected like an explosion. It's, <clears throat> it's following an, an a gradient. It's, it's, you know, it's being, just like any current. It's being pulled, not pushed. Yeah, well, this is kind of exactly what what I mean. That that there is a definitely a, some other process involved, which impacts solar wind motion in, in a huge way. And by the way, uh, I mean even the whole picture that the solar wind is just you know like a homogeneous sea of material. It is completely wrong. We we know that solar wind is more like a just a almost like hair of a sun or something, you know, a bunch of re relatively tight streams, you know, like in a plasma ball rather than, uh, again, some, some sort of atmosphere the, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. We tend to ima imagine it or, you know, just right off the bat that it's, it's got a you know, smooth, smooth homo homogeneity to it. But... Well, I mean, if you take the that kind of scale that you can see on these graphs, then yeah, it might be considered homogeneous, maybe. Uh, but if you if you look at how how it actually behaves, uh, it sh I mean, no, you should you should consider <laughs> the other version. Right, right, right. There's this 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 one thing here that we were looking at. It's, it's pretty cool. The guy GIF that we ran into. Hopefully, yeah, that, that, this one. Well, in, in energetics, um, which uh, for me personally, I is my understanding that energetics has to follow these general electromagnetic principles. But uh, in energetics, pretty much everything is in a pulsation or kind of a like an increase and decrease and then increase and decrease, but not necessarily the same increase or the same decrease each time and not necessarily the same length or even the same frequency. And that's kind of what gives uh, a continual renewal of, you know, like you need weather to be uh, a bit chaotic because if it's too regular, um, then somewhere is going without. You need it to be constantly, there's a drought somewhere and there's a flood somewhere and, um, and, and even some life forms, you know, need like obviously famously many trees need forest fires in order to actually seed, but they don't need a forest fire every year. So that's my understanding as to how yeah. the universe in general is going to work on a, on a larger scale or a smaller scale. That was, I mean, that was one of the things I, I worked at Yellowstone when I was like 21 years old, but I worked at Yellowstone and like the, the one thing that they had started doing was like let let the fires burn there in order to keep the ecosystem balanced. They used to go, you know, take them, you know, just... Well, you know, if there's a fire, they would all ru always run at it and clear it and, and, and just put it out, you know. But this, this screwed up the ecosystem, actually, of Yellowstone. So they stopped doing it. They would let them burn in some in controlled manner. Yeah, you know? Exactly. In, in, um, in energetic medicine, if you, you know, kind of whatever, play God and you kind of hold something back for a long time, there's always some kind of snapback. And it can be a very severe reaction. And of course, the general goal is to try and smooth um, the the movements. But even in the channels, uh, energy comes in pulsation. So there's different times of day, different organs and different channels are stronger than other ones, which means you're weaker in those other channels. And there's potentially a way to get sick uh, if you're exposed just at the wrong time. So it's a it's a concept that I try to, to look at all sorts of things like uh, economics, um, cultural phenomena, you know, things like uh, what's popular, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I try to see, I try to see the waves that, that are being presented. Right. That's right. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, it, that's a, that's again, this syncretist idea. Not everybody gets into syncretism. So, 
The, the, the one that, that keeps ringing bells for me is this, the, uh, it's a little exotic, but, but uh, the, 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 this, this Dirac, the Dirac impulse thing. You start, I mean, you kind of see something happening here where there's an energetic, you know, kind of, kind of a pop, you know, this. Oh, you mean the, the Dirac Delta? Yeah. Like a, uh-huh. yeah. 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 That's a important. But, yeah. But in, like any time function, those things, the, those things pop out, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. and, and uh, obviously, you know, it's, 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 the, the, this, I hate using the word obviously, sorry. The, the, uh, 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 the, the, the frequency, uh, you know, just tightening, and then all of a sudden you have that spike. You know, sine x over x thing. You know. So we're see, I, you know, I, I worked in cardiology for a while, and you, the, the the nature of that heartbeat is pretty compelling. You know. Yeah. Whoa. What was um, that? You may. You may. I have no idea. <laughs> you may find it interesting that. Um, in Chinese medicine, that there are a number of uh, substances that are uh, not in Western medicine. So obviously we have blood and, and fluid and all that. But uh, we also have um, a substance, a vital substance, uh, called pulse. And the pulse is, of course, related to the actual the flow, but it's not only related to that. And it's something that you generate in your heart, and it needs to propagate throughout the body. And it can become reversed, and it can move around. It can become displaced, actually, and even rise up into the head. And it is related to um, a different signal or substance that uh, comes from what's called the dantian, which is in the belly, in the um, just below the navel. Okay. And which uh, I'm, I'm calling that one signal. Because uh, I think we need a Western name for it. D- Dantian. Uh, yeah, the Dantian is the well, Dantian literally means an elixir field. So wow. it's uh, yeah yeah like a like a special pill field. Um, so this concept, of course, they mean it literally is a field. But it's interesting how the word ends up playing playing out. Um, so this signal, when it rises up and sits where the heart is, the pulse, as a response, rises up and actually sits in the throat or even higher up into the head. And this is very unhealthy. And wow. not only does it lead to thyroid problems, but it can lead to you know, migraines and sensory problems. Right? You can have a, a loss of function in the eyes, the ears. And I have been noting this. When, you, when you're moving pulse back down to the chest, you can actually watch it go down the neck. There will be extra throbbing in the uh, carotid area, uh, uh-huh. and, and even in the SCM muscles, you have to actually needle those muscles to let them soften so that this energy will go down. And then I teach my patients to swallow the pulse back down into the heart and you need it to settle uh-huh. right, right down by the xiphoid process. Uh, if it, if you don't get all the way down, if you get stuck in the thymus, it'll just rise back up the next day when they get stressed out again. Uh-huh. So it's definitely related to the fight or flight. It's, uh, it's about an- anxiety, anxiety causes yeah. it. Uh-huh. Now, the physical pulse obviously still remains. But over a long period of time, if the substance my is either lost or uh, displaced, the physical pulses will become interrupted, and there will be a problem either between the left and right, especially the or between more likely the atria and the vent- and the ventricle, and what you'll get is uh, what we call the coming and going pulse. Um, sometimes you get, will get a chopping, maybe an indicative of thick blood. Um, there can also be uh, something called the drum skin pulse, which uh, is a defense response. The body actually hardens up as a protection mechanism, and you get the feeling like there's a tight drum skin over top of the pulse. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you how do you monitor like the location of it? I mean, are you oh, saying is it these a, days? So in the ancient days, they used all the nine classic pulses. Anymore, these days we just use the, the radial pulse is generally what's used. You can still, of course, use the pedal pulse and the all the other pulses. Okay, but we typically only use the uh, radial pulse. Mm-hmm. There's about 30 different pulse uh, descriptions. And, of course, rate is important, but 
uh, to be honest with you, Chinese medicine is so strict. If your rate isn't exactly 60, you got a problem anyhow. So that, right. that's not enough information in Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we're interested in what's called the quality of the pulse. And from an energy standpoint, actually, you can feel it come out of the pulse and enter uh, your body. And that's how you can get more information. That's the secret as to uh, how these pulse masters, um, which are still around, there are people who can do this and they can tell when you've had an injury at what age, et cetera. Uh, and that, that's because they're actually getting information from your body through what are called mirror neurons. They're, they're having an empathetic moment and there's some type of information that's exchanged, but we don't know exactly how. But I can tell you that it, you do feel it go through your fingertips and into your body. And sometimes, you know, you get really interesting um, information from that, which uh, sometimes scares the crap out of my patients. I'll be honest with you. They don't, they, <laughs> they get a little bit, they get, they, they get really weirded out when I am figuring out things, especially when they hide, try to hide things, you know, like if they're smoking weed and then they haven't told me, you know, things like that. Okay. Okay. What, what impact yeah. does that have? Uh, what stuff they haven't told me or is it just smoking weed in general since you brought it up? Oh, uh, from an herbal standpoint, marijuana uh, creates a lot of phlegm and heat. Okay. Yeah. It's a middling herb. It's not a superior herb. Mm -hmm. So it's not without cost. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any, anything, any, any herb or substance, it could be a refined substance too, like Tylenol or whatever, uh, acetaminophen. Anything that you take, it, 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 its grade depends on how much you get versus how much it costs you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like for example, um, uh, ginseng is not a superior herb. Ginseng is a middling herb because it does over time raise your blood pressure. Ginger is a superior herb though because you can cook it, use it in all sorts of things. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just just got some of that actually. But the pulse, the pulse, back to the subject of the pulse, I wrote a whole blog article about it, and I was using my um, meridian circuit uh, as a model because I really think that uh, we have got to figure out what these, these uh, energy sources are. I think that they have a lot more to, they have a lot to say about how things go in our life because there are repetitious references in like yoga and Taoism and Buddhism and even in Christianity all over to the heart and, and how the, either the soul or the original mind, the, the face, the golden flower, uh, all these things resting in the heart. And so I really think that this uh, electric like signal might be uh, more important than, than we're giving uh, thought to on a mm -hmm. daily basis. Mm -hmm. We look at it very mechanistically and I think that's a big we problem. You know? I mean, uh, that was one of the reasons I got out of the, got out of the business, you know, because it was, it was, uh, it just seemed to, too, uh, you know, materialistic to the extreme, you know, it's, it's, it's like, this is things just, just a, 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 an interesting mechanism that, uh, just by, by, uh, keep, keeping, keeping flow, like, I mean, one of the main things you do for arrhythmia is you, uh, you take the, like here's pulmonary ostea, right? And there there are errant signals that can come in here and, and screw up in the left atrium. So what they do is with this catheter, they do an ablation. It's basically a cauterization of this ostea and it blocks the signals from coming in and then quote unquote solves the arrhythmia, right? This is a very expensive procedure, but it's commonly done. And it's like, it's, 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 it's that, that's, to me, that's just brutally primitive and, and like mechanistic, a mess. Well, and it, and, it, and, and the solve, yeah. the solve is like, you know, they get like 60, 70 percent on it. And it's uh, OK, you're, you're, right. you're well, fixing that's, something. That's, but 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 I think it seems to me you're, you're causing more damage than anything. You know? That's that's because and this is a thing I try to emphasize, especially with my athlete patients that come in. The energetics determine how the mechanism works, right? But then the mechanical body is what keeps alive. It keeps uh, creating the uh, energetic body. There's a common misconception that the chakras are the glands, and that's not true. The chakras, the glands are the fruit of the chakra. 
but the functioning of the nerves and glands together and their rhythmic behavior nourishes the tree of life. So they, there's a cyclical, uh, there's a reciprocal effect between the energetic and the mechanical. So uh, take uh, something like uh, laminectomies. Um, it's a mechanical solution to what seems like a totally mechanical problem. However, almost, it seems like almost 100% of the time, within a few years, the person is back to the same very uh, same problem. Now, could it be that their back has com uh, continued to collapse? It's totally possible. But from um, our perspective, it's a continuation of the improper signal. And the improper signal continues these circuits. Uh, that's the, the basis of my, of my hypothesis surrounding uh, how meridians are really working, is that you have this circuit as an input and an output, and if the, the signal, if the reverse uh, signal or the end voltage on the right, the pressure from the left, then the channel is not going to propagate. And I, I think that that would go a long way to explaining some things don't work out, whereas other times, of course, the mechanical solution is going to be perfectly fine. Chiropractic is going to be fine. Muscle resetting, uh, cupping, those are going to be perfectly fine unless you don't get rid of the signal. If the signal remains, if the nerves keep pumping out that signal, of course, they're going to still feel pain or, of course, they're still going to have a continuation of, like, say, an autoimmune condition. Uh, anyways, uh, not trying to get us off on the side side topic no, it's I cool do... i mean it's, it's to me there's a message coming through that there, there's a fairly significant connection going on between these these seemingly disparate i you know topics so yeah they yeah. seem disparate but the electric universe is bringing them together really right because we we can start to use electrical uh, sorry this is the hypothesis of uh, that i've presented is we can use circuit modeling in order to simulate of course if you cut a person open you're not going to find an inductor and a transformer you're certainly not going to find one in a tiny microscopic point but they've measured these values they've measured inductance and impedance in the tissues so we might be capable of producing um very complex models uh and of course because my circuit's an analog circuit that would make it very very Difficult. We have to find a way to digitize it just for the sake of, you know, the computing power, right? Otherwise, you'd need a SETI-like network to analyze a single person. But um, isn't that that whole approach also kind of too mechanistical? I mean, to represent a human body as an electric circuit, which is a kind of a completely different thing in the first place. Uh, like, like yeah. you, you just basically make such an in, extreme reductionism in some sense. Uh, yes, but that's why it's only a simulation, right? It, you also still have to have the image, the imaging, right? You have to, have to do thermography, and you have to look at the all the signals coming out of the body. You can't only use uh, the circuit model. The goal is um, just like uh, like AlphaGo, you know, it's trying to anticipate. Uh, the opponent in this case would you would be trying to anticipate if if I uh, have a sprained ankle how would that propagate because there is strong research for example that injuries to the outside of the foot are a lead later on to conditions such as Parkinson's there's a whole book of research on that it's a 300 page book and I've gone around to at my bo boxing club and asked these Parkinson's guys, and a huge number of them have foot injuries in their past, in their childhood usually. So how can we anticipate uh, the propagation of the signal? And it can be really, really important. I had a, a case. Um, this is kind of a sad case. I, I failed at this one. So this patient had had bad acupuncture at a competitor. Not a local competitor, but in, in my state, though. This person had done what he thought was classical needling, which meant thick and deep and very hard. But he had mislocated the point, and he had reversed the direction in uh, how we needle, so you should be normally doing it perpendicularly. And he had done it obliquely. The man went into um, a spasmodic state, and he sweat for about an hour in a fetal position. And he was left in a cold room, which is also um, really important. 
Now, what happened is afterwards he developed a sore in the spot. It, it looked like a diabetic uh, weeping ulcer. It could not be like antibiotics, everything uh, that was tried could not stop this thing. By the time I got the energy signal going the positive direction, he ran out of money, went back to work, and uh, you know was wearing construction boots, and it just got worse. He eventually did it end up being amputated. Oh. Now, in the Chinese, and I know, I know, it's dangerous. In the Chinese medicine, though, by the time I figured out what's going on there, the reverse of flow, that signal can continue even without the foot there and can continue up the leg. And of course, you hope to, of course, the, all the gangrene and stuff would all be gone. But the actual signal would continue propagating, um, was removed. And it does, you, you feel it leave uh, when you have a, 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 like I guess you would call it a little ball of negative energy, you feel it when it leaves. Uh, and I instruct people in that all the time. This is a little bit more sinister uh, because he'd had treatment from this other person uh, and before he came to see me with this weeping wound. And we call is that there, yin, a yin ulcer. So it's not, you can't treat it with antibiotics. Is there um, a reflexology to, uh, having to do with the tops of the foot too? Um, uh, uh, yeah, there's pretty much, refle you, can, you can create uh, reflexology and homunculuses throughout the entire body because of all the dermatomes. Because dermatomes give you <laughs> ability Sorry. The body. I'm laughing because I love your your knowledge about this. All these words I have never heard of. I love <laughs> oh, a dermatome. So, uh, so yeah, a dermatome <laughs> is a, a nerve innervation of the skin, and a myotome is a nerve innervation of the muscle. Nice. Okay. Oh, all right. okay. Wow. So, so uh, to go back to what you were saying earlier, is the simulation of a human in an electrical impulse. Um, uh, I, I love the idea, but like, like, sort of like with what Eugene said, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I know you batted away the idea of it being reductionist, and maybe this could go along with what you're talking about, but uh, the heart and the flow of the heart and the blood and the the um, the cycling of the blood does that does that produce a um, different currents and like you were talking about earlier, the pulse of the body. Is that um, like energy induced or like, I mean. Yeah, so uh, these are really good questions. So first of all, I don't want to bat anything away. I'll tell you this. The, my, my paper is based on a previous electrical engineer's paper who's in Taiwan. And he introduced something called uh, chaotic wave theory. Uh, and he said that he was using a fractal, a fractal continuum. Now, my problem with his model, he had a really interesting uh, uh, Y circuit uh, for his model, um, is that it's totally passive. There's no um, like uh, active sensory, right? And we can't just follow the physiology. We need to follow the pathophysiology of both Chinese and Western science that have to be covered. So my model is a fractal model, but it is the circuit represents the point and the whole channel and or the whole continuum of all the channels which all link together. So you can use it on all the different levels. So the values for each of the uh, components will have to change depending on the scale that you're looking at. So if you're looking at an individual point or an individual cell or um, an entire, like say the IT band, you're gonna have to find the different values for those. So it, it's not so simple to reduce anything at all. And, and like it would need probably to get any reasonable simulation going uh, is probably on the order of 100 million of these analog circuits running through a simulation simultaneously. Of course, we beginning with the Chinese medicine, they reduce it to 12 channels, uh, roughly 1,000 points, uh, not counting the reflexology points of the ear and scalp, and um, uh, a few correspondences. Now, there's other rules, too, and that's what you're alluding to, uh, buddy, yeah, I, I, you just went blank for a little bit there. Maybe, maybe uh, my back. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. The chi moves, warms, and regulates the blood, and blood is the mother of chi. So there is a reciprocal relationship between them, in which the the hydrodynamic flow is going to be influenced by the uh, the way the nerves 
cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation or increased cardio out output. And of course, that's related to the hormones too. And the flow of that is definitely uh, related to the circulation of chi. So uh, when I see people and their hands look like they're becoming arthritic, almost always there is a circulation of blood problem and a circulation of chi problem. They're both going hand in hand, uh, no pun intended. But could you, could you, I mean, since you're so in depth of this, could, could you give like kind of like maybe a 50,000 foot view of like the, the history and, the, and like of, uh, the known history of, of acupuncture and like f oh, the, from whence it, from whence it came and, <laughs> and, and yeah. the known history is that the oldest book we have, uh, the author is, uh, Oh, now you're back. back. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, they only last for about a second and a half or so. The, the author is who is talking to the Yellow Emperor, who we are speculating, of course, was a Saturn. So not a real, doc, not a real king. But um, it's still given a format. Now, that book is 2,600 years old. In that book, Chibo laments that the art of the ancients has already been lost. Mm -hmm. Uh, going back to maybe the Shang Dynasty, uh, possibly the Xia, but it doesn't seem possible to many. But they did find a needle in the, somewhere in Eurasia that was 20-some thousand years old that was not used for sewing. So we don't know. Okay. Um, now, in India, they have their uh, a channel-based medicine as well. It's, it's a completely sister medicine. And India, of course, maintains that their that their medicine is at least ten thousand years old, if you want to believe it. Um, there's a documentary uh, on used to be on Netflix, at least it might be on YouTube, called uh, Ayurveda: uh, Science of Life. And in it, you can watch a man paralyze a goat with a pressure point, and then he unparalyzes the goat. Wow. So, okay. Yeah, and there's a documentary that I do encourage people to watch called Nine Thousand Needles, in which a man from my state. Uh, who was Mr. Kentucky, and he had two brothers who were also super, or they were bodybuilders. But the man uh, from Kentucky, he had a basically a stroke. I mean, it was an aneurysm, but it was related to his using steroids. And you watch him go to China, and he walks out of that hospital. Uh, not without assistance, but he had already had the condition uh, for many months before he actually went. And that documentary is totally on YouTube. Uh, it's called 9,000 Needles. Needles, oh, okay. Entire, yeah, 9,000 Needles. The entire documentary is available, at last I saw, on on, uh, am, on uh, YouTube. Okay. And um, I've heard he may have died since uh, the making of that documentary, but it's a very remarkable documentary at any rate. He was getting acupuncture, though, two times a day, plus PT, plus uh, massages and herbs. I mean, it wasn't... Uh, a small amount it, he and they got a good deal i mean it was like twenty thousand dollars it's a very touching documentary okay um so the those two documentaries i definitely could recommend to people who are interested in how this energy flow may be um, uh, proven or or discovered um there are some really wild uh energy uh, stuff out there some of it's more reliable than others in terms of you know, uh, no touch, uh, work and, um, use of things that are like Reiki, but superior. Um, all of it, we, we don't really know how it works, but if channels really are, um, transceiver signals, uh, circuits, right. They're, where they're able to, on some level, maybe the DNA, we don't know, receive and put out energy signals and that these can be modeled maybe that's a way that we can start explaining it um that i don't know mm -hmm. it seems like it's tied it seems like it's tied to spooky action at a distance it might be uh, that's one of my speculations but i'm not averse to talking about um some type of uh, different electromagnetic wave or uh something else um i have and not then, yeah go ahead and then and then it also uh Reminds me of uh, the no nocebo and the placebo um, effects because both of them work very well. And uh, if you're if you're in dire need and you're on a, f a phone call and it's your last resort and you're calling Ingo Swan 
to uh, cure you for, with his mental powers and his chi from the other side of the world, you're going to believe that it's going to happen, and then you could get cured. You know, I mean, you might not believe, but whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, so. There's a there's a, a soft scientific explanation for that without even going into um, the possibility of entanglement, but essentially the body having these reserves of these vital substances, one of them being essence, that even a person who is near to dead, uh, in, especially in cases where the disease and, and doesn't involve a severe degeneration but is more sudden, um, cancer patient, right? The, a lot of times the person is dying because of the disruption of proper physiological function in the body, not because they are out of reserve. Back. Especially like HIV, right? Uh, in AIDS, you know, usually there's a decision, but uh, not in every case. And so if there's a reserve of life force in the person and the mind having general over, as we've studied monks in the snow or, you know, controlling their digestive system, controlling their sexual functions, etc., cetera, uh, it may be possible for people under the right influence, whether it's hypnosis or a placebo or suggestion or whatever, or prayer, for them to generate the proper signal to access that, that energy source. And then, of course, promote proper metabolic function and, and regeneration so it, of cells. So it points, it points to mind again, mind over matter again. Well, yes, the Taoists say that my, the mind is the essential. So mm -hmm. everything okay. surrounding the, the, the mind and then uh, how it all interplays is a, a nonlinear interaction. We don't know. Uh, sometimes it seems like karma is more important. Sometimes it seems like fate. Sometimes it seems like chaos. Uh, it just depends on. And then there's there's always that little bit of luck, you know. And and mankind hasn't really. We've not done any better. There's a whole panel of quantum physicists arguing as to which of their solutions is correct, and all of them apparently are correct, but they are completely different in their mechanism. <laughs> That's a fun panel. Right, right. Well, like a two hour. Well, the, two right, hour. right. I mean, the, the need to have one solution. This is this is a, you know, a problematic. I would say, you know. This. I think that was a Brian Green panel. I don't know if anybody did anybody see. You know what I'm talking about? Where he has the four physicists, one's presenting cubism, and and anyways, it all boiled down. I was like, oh, that one's luck, and that one's chaos, and that one's fate. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, have you seen that? No, uh, -uh no. Yeah, it's a pretty good panel. It was a few years ago. I think it was like 2014. Okay. Yeah. And of course, each one is convinced that their model is more correct. And, and they understand the other physicists have good models as well, but they're there to present their argument. And then what I what I really loved is the guy who was presenting cubism was a total... Um, he was different, let's just say. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> His, he was He was fun. Cube, cubism as as a as a a, a, phys, a a basic model of physics. Uh, you know, well, with a Q. So this Q, is probably where Qism, Eugene, Qism. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, where Eugene like chaos to me. To be honest with you, it was <laughs> it was a strange model, but mathematically, supposedly, it works. Have you heard of that, Eugene? Not entirely. Only the end of it. Okay. Q, 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 Qism. I'm, I'm curious, curious now. You know, these are flow of consciousness things, so it makes it makes it kind of fun. So I consider it play here. But, but Q, Qism. How, how would you? How, how would I look that up? What, I, what I'm just gonna do? I'm gonna see if I can find that exact panel because I think oh, cool. that people okay. like it because it's, it was really weird. Hours long, so you know, on your own, <laughs> it was pretty weird. So, uh, Shifu, you were saying that basically what I hear is this model that you're working on involves uh, uh, there's there's nodes and filaments, and the filaments and the nodes are both part of the same. Um, right. They're, uh, they're, they're a fractal. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think that that's how it ultimately has to be broken down as far as what we've been shown as science into a filament and node type of structure um the more we learn the more we see that nature is mirroring that type of uh system that flow symmetry or uh asymmetry however it branches but um 
yeah, yeah, that's 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 how I see it too. And and going going back to how everything connects, our minds connect, minds and healing pathways and prayer and all of these different things. Our our three brains, our heart, our brain, and our gut working in combination together. Um, uh, I'd say I'd say it's necessary to have all three of them. Like the gut is just is just as necessary as the heart is just as necessary as the brain, and I don't know where I'm right. going with that. But. Well, you can actually using the Fibonacci, you can divide the entire thing up into you two, the three, the five, or the eight, uh, or you can again use thirteen if you like to use the channels. Um, technically, according to the, that could get it into the into the thousands. Yeah, you should be able to go through channels that are uh, I, I, the way I see it. They're nested and they're in in some sort of like um, umbilical type of manner and wombs. And all of these uh, these filaments are wombed or entombed or wrapped around each other in what Vladimir Ginsburg refers to as the helicola and these helices within helices. And there, there has to be a parameter for the outside, the epidermis of these Birkeland currents. You know, you have the dermal layers, the interior layers, and then you have the uh, epidermis. And, and ultimately, there is an outside shape to everything. So uh, fusing the outside with the inner, um, I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the dynamics of how the filaments braid and entangle from one thought healing one person to one thought being received and actually being healed the healer and the healed you know I'm, i guess i'm talking about yeah, astral dude. lines yeah like, are you nice, having seen... nice chirping yeah the chirping was good <laughs> the yeah. yeah that was really nice <laughs> have you seen the krillian photography where they did uh they they had when a, a man and a woman are in love and they put their hand on and then versus a, a man is interested in the woman, but she's not interested in him. Have you seen that? Those, those Krillian photographs? Not those particularly, but I have well, other ideas. Well, it's, it's really interesting I'll because, and again, it needs to be uh, verified because these people could be selling something or whatever. However, in the photographs in the, in the male and the woman and the, and the man are in love, the lines go right together, just as beautiful as um, you know mitosis. And then when the man is interested in the woman, the lines go towards her hand, but her lines go away from uh, his lines. And then his become turbulent and kind of buckle off. So again, uh, that's something felt in the heart, love, and, uh, in, and sensed in the mind, and yet is showing up potentially, right? Uh, this is all allegedly but it's, I, I believe the research, I just need to do it myself at some point, um, on these electrified plates during Krillian photography. I found that to be really compelling and, and potentially true. I, I mean, I, I'm more skeptical on that than uh, some other uh, researches that are really cool, like the water bridge, you know, and the, the experiment that Eugene has mentioned. Um, I... I, I have a lot more hope in those experiments, but the Krillian one fascinates me because it feels intuitively true, and then there's some objective uh, demonstration that's been provided. Well, also there's there's quite a bit of um, I think it was probably a decade I ran across uh, a decade ago I ran across these papers that were talking about these doctors all around the world that were showing proof of a human energy field, the. Uh, and when uh, an, an enlightened uh, person or a healer entered the room, the amount of lumens in the room actually goes up. Yes, that has a and name. And when someone who's not uh, enlightened, just like an average Joe Schmo or whatever, goes in the room, nothing happens. Correct. That is you know, actually was, it referred to. This... Okay. Go ahead, Eugene. Oh, yeah, I was just going to mention this Pauli effect. Maybe you heard about that. You know that Wolfgang Pauli was uh, interested in some esoteric stuff like psychoanalysis and, you know, archetypes and these, these types of things. Uh, but he also was one of the main figures in quantum mechanics. 
Uh, so uh, there's uh, this in interesting thing called Pauli effect. So somebody noticed that whenever Pauli appeared in the lab, uh, s some equipment started malfunctioning. <laughs> uh -huh. right. And, and right. it kept happening over and over. And uh, actually, there there's a sort of an anecdote about that, that uh, once the head of the laboratory noticed that kind of everything started malfunctioning, but Pauli wasn't around, but he kind of sent notes to, to other people to know whether Pauli was somewhere near. And they said, oh, yeah, he was in town at that day, you know, when your <laughs> labs <laughs> broke down. Yeah. I definitely think that it's it's more than um, more than a little possible. Uh, now that we're the the subject of the lighting in the room that is referenced in that Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic 2,600 years ago. It's called Tong Shen Ming, and Ming means brightness. It means a light that comes out of the chest, and it also has a double meaning for your destiny. M -I -N -G. Well, it's already been proven that we, that we emit bio photons, um, I think, not only out of our eyes, but other places, right? All right. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. There is a light. We call that, we just call that spirit in the medicine, um, but it's not the spirit. It's just like your affect, and it shows up in the eyes, and, and when people walk in and, they're, and there's not enough light coming out of their eyes, that's the first thing I have to treat, there, because there will be no improvement in their knee or their neck or whatever else. So long as they have their 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 bioluminescence is blocked. How do you tell? Um, just just you just observe. Oh, you could see it on them. You could yeah. you. I could teach you within a half an hour. You could start spotting red shadow, Easy. green shadow, uh, black shadow. You could start spotting um, hollowness, sadness, uh, depression. You could spot all of it really really simply. Mm -hmm. I knew I knew about Robin Williams long before everybody else. I mean, I, I was reading it on him for a long time. Huh. Uh, okay. It. it the, the, what he was going through was so internally painful. It's amazing to me that he lasted this long. Right. But it right. makes me really sad. It makes me really sad that, that these people, as rich as they are and as, as loved as they are, still can't get the kind of help. There's a woman right, right. in India who had the most amazing voice, but it, she must have sung at the wrong time, wrong season, or something. And dryness, the the dry. Uh, wave entered in her throat. She can't even cry. She can't laugh. She can't talk in a normal voice. It hurts so bad. Mm -hmm. And she's tried everything, but uh, without any people practicing the ancient, ancient medicine uh, where energy is displaced, you know, we're talking biblical age kind of medicine, um, she can't be cured. And now it's been in her throat. There's probably going to be scarring on her vocal cords. She'll never, even if you got it out of there and she could speak normal, she'll never sound like she used to. Uh, and and her her voice was um, just unreal. She was the Madonna of India. Wow! And, and wow! Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sheila, Sheila Chandra, and she literally can't sing or talk anymore. Huh. huh. I mean, she whispers if she can do anything. Right. Right. It's a shame. The scarification. Yeah. It's really. It's it's it's, it's terrible. And it happens to. It can happen to anyone. Um, you know, people can have weird things. And again, this signal pro uh, propagation I mentioned in my paper. I had a patient who came in and she had a shingles reaction, but mm -hmm. not to somebody having chickenpox. Uh, she got stung by a wasp. Now, when she got stung by the wasp in the back, we treated the, the dermatomes of the back. And then uh, about four or five um, sessions in, I started walking into the room. It smelled like suntan lotion. And mm -hmm. come to find out, she had been overloading her body with suntan lotion for years and years. And so she was, she was sweating out suntan lotion. And the room was so thick with suntan lotion, it made me gag. Right, right. And oh. so the, the toxicity of the lotion blocking the, the normal physiology. But as soon as, because we had already cupped the, the wasp wound and all the poison had been pulled, all that was left was her body's negative reaction now because the, the positive energy and the negative energy do not get along. And so if you try to restore the positive energy, you want everything. And now she had to sweat out all those years of toxin. And she was, uh, she just loved to sunbathe. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Makes and me want to go to the sauna. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, too much is, uh, can be bad, too. But sweating is generally a good thing. Right. I cannot find this panel. Um, I'm finding lots of panels. 
but I can't find this one with Brian Green and these four quantum physicists. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. If you type quantum panel and Brian Green yeah, yeah. on okay. YouTube, okay. phone book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the phone book. I'll tell you okay. that. Okay. <laughs> A lot of Isaac Asimov. Um, yeah, if I ever find it, I'll put it in the uh, EU chat. But um, these signals, uh, again, whatever they are, we don't really quite quite know. I, I suspect that they're not strictly um, action potentials going down nerve channels. Um, I think that there is a lot more going on, but we just don't have any other. We just don't know. Uh, we're gonna have to do. Well, we don't even. Go ahead. We don't even know how it works in our body. Nonetheless, how it works outside of our bodies with our uh, bioplasmas. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, there's all sorts of interactions that are that are going on all the time. I, I think that we we probably take for granted how many sensory inputs that we're having at any one time. If it weren't for the reticular formation, none of us would be capable of handling anything, right? Because that's the, it. It literally right there, right? it no the reticular formation literally blocks ninety nine plus percent of your sensation, so you're not screaming in pain all the time. Oh, so that's the the sensory editing happens in the reticular yes. formation. Isn't that a cone a cone shape too? I do not remember. I'd have to look at the anatomical chart. I don't want to be quoted. There it is. Uh, right in the center, it's, it's really important. It's it's in between your lower central nervous system and your uh, peripheral nervous system. So it's a really important uh, structure. Um, Guess what? I just found out about that on um, my friend composed a documentary, Chad Simo Morris, and I shared it with the group. I don't know if anybody took some time to look at it, but there's wonderful things. And one of the things that I found inside of it is that when the heart beats, the reticular formation beats with it in your brain. And and David, possibly you could pull up a, a video of the heartbeat in the brain. You could actually see it. It's liquid. So the power of this pulse wave that you were talking about earlier at the beginning of this episode makes me think about that. The pulsation is right there inside that, inside your brain and your heart where they meet. Um, uh, yeah, I, I certainly do think that it can be invaded, uh, what we call displaced energy sources. So where this, this kind of, again, it's, it can be anywhere from a, from a nut, nut-sized uh, signal to a as I've seen negative signals in people as big as footballs, but most commonly baseball uh, to softball size, they can rise up and move throughout the body. The most common way that people feel these uh, signals move about is when they feel a negative one go down the leg, back or hip treatment, but it could be a leg treatment, and they'll feel like they're having a Charlie horse moving, feel it going down, and if they do a really good job they'll feel it go out the bottom of the foot and it feels like a ball leaving the bottom of your foot. Wow. It's a lot of fun, but they don't really, because they're, everybody expects that they're coming in for a spa thing and, and here they are, they're getting Charlie horses and stuff. <laughs> 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 oh, well, <laughs> it's not a popularity thing. <laughs> if they want to transform. That's really cool. Yeah. I've seen that before. It's just for, it's worth another look. So and it, they and amplify it could be. the movement here. Yeah. The uh, yeah, that's beautiful. What's causing it? Well, I mean, the all heartbeat. of all of your nerves, God. they're not capable of wiggling. Then you have a major problem. If they wiggle too much, it's probably an indicator that you have this extra energy source, and it needs to be actually excreted. Um, I have a terrible name for it too. <laughs> when it comes out, and you could feel it in the room because it smells. Okay, guys, when you walk in the room and a person oh, okay. has out, if even if it's not cigarette like smoke, a brain people, fart. Uh, you, yeah, <laughs> what, uh, it's nasty. I mean, whether it's from excessive sleep or it's from sugar, they have uh, some kind of internal chemistry problem, or again, like a suntan lotion, or they've been over applying uh, shampoo or something. Um, I just call it all ejectum because ejectum. it's, it's okay. an unpleasant ejectum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's, it's something in the room. It, the air is thicker. 
Uh, it can, can make you tell us. Can you tell us your process? Are Are you doing meditation? Is it a steamed room? I mean, I'm trying no, to envision this here. It's acupuncture. I I leave. I leave the room. I don't want to sit there while they're doing it. I mean, <laughs> plus, it interferes. Once I put the needles in and I instruct them how to breathe, I leave. Now sometimes they'll they'll think that I was in there, um, and that's all you know, uh, spirit work, etc. But um, most of the time they just sit there and they'll have an internal experience and some of them will have profound experiences that they might see animals or they might see colors or hear things or memories or uh, they'll tremble and shake or they'll have electric uh, lightning they'll have cold heat whatever um, are you sensitive are you sensitive to smell uh, not usually if it's a bad chemical because I'm a lung type it can it can do me but uh, I don't usually have a problem with perfumes or anything. Uh, okay. There was one time was my wife sprayed something; it gave me instant bronchitis. But other than that, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I, I was just curious because um, you, a, a lot of people who are, you know, deal with energy work and stuff like that, or empaths, and or not not necessarily have to be an empath, but uh, are experiencing uh, heightened senses and the heightened sense of smell and stuff. Yeah, no, I don't. And I don't have senses. Wondering if it's just because they smelled. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. I don't have synesthesia, and this is, it's not a normal smell. What I'm talking about, it's, it's. But anybody can smell. By the time it gets out of the body, anyone can walk in and smell. If the person smells like they've so been weird. working in a horse stable, um, they didn't. They obviously do, but they wore new clothes today, and they walk <laughs> in, and you don't, don't smell horses on them, and then they lay, and then they eject this this smell, and they smell like a horse stable. Um, it's obvious that they've been imprinted by this this odor and their work and sometimes it is also true that they are mostly stressed out because of their work and they may love horses but hate the work that happens yeah. that happens a lot I get a lot of horse because I'm in Kentucky I get a lot of people that are in pain because uh, the work has stressed them well well a, another weird thing is um, apparently the uh, I've been st studying the sense of smell uh, the past week, and some of the stuff I've learned is that it's like a lock and key mechanism. That it's actually a shape. What we're smelling is shapes. Oh. Um, and they fit inside of our uh, uh, nose receptacles as certain shapes. But then they went deeper into the study and found out that it's not always like that because um, cyanide smells like almonds. And uh, yeah, I, one of them will kill you, and one of them's fine, you know. Yeah. But like that makes me wonder yeah, if that sense awesome. of smell, like coming in your in your in your lungs, you know, like you're gonna generally smell like the situation that you're around in a way. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, as as far as I know, the kind of the best guess at the moment, although I'm I'm not sure if it's an accepted theory, and you know physiological world but uh, at least I, I believe this is true that uh, basically what nose detects is again yeah not not really the shapes because similar shapes might produce completely different smell but it's the the actual electromagnetic spectrum of the vibrations of the molecule you know that is you know rotational vibrational spectrum of, of of the atoms in the molecule that you're smelling that that's what determines the smell so basically you know quantum chemistry of this molecule mm -hmm. so yep. the, it, seem, it the seems like, it seems like it seems like in the nose there is some sort of uh, spectral analyzer and it's electromagnetic it's not you know something else it's probably hairs, right? Because usually with most of our senses, it comes down to cilia or rods and cones. Um, it's weird how necessary hair is. Like in our ears, it all comes down to hair. I would assume it probably comes down to something along with hair, along the lines of hair in our nose, in our uh, olfactory there. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you, you know, the shape of the, the cochlea and everything, and, and, and then the wide range of frequencies that it, that it has. And then, you know, the eyes are limited pretty much to an octave. And I'm wondering if, if you could do the same kind of 
uh, you know, just the perspective on this. I wonder, wonder what the, that uh, notch is that it is open to. Um, I, I'd like to bring forth that. This is Ignacio. Sorry. Hey. Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, a bit sick, but uh, to the point, um, mystics report that there are corollary senses in the spiritual world to all our physical senses. So that there are spiritual uh, olfactory and sight and sound and tactile stuff that happens directly into consciousness. And that maybe, you know, I've had this experience because uh, I have a very weak sense of smell. Sometimes I am having an olfactory experience and sometimes I cannot. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm experiencing some like spiritual sensation of... Uh, smell and most of the time I don't have the little receptors to pick it up over uh -huh. that so, reminds me of a lot of uh, like this the uh, when a spiritual event happens people say that there is a smoky smell in the air or a sweet smell when an angel visits or other things like that right and what we have is not the ability to distinguish between a, a physical vibration and etheric uh, energy which could be very much electrical and mm. an astral uh, influence which is definitely uh, consciousness to consciousness world and the mystics report that the scent of flowers and associated with spiritual beings is an astral experience whereas something related to acupuncture would be something more etheric at least that's the theory so i i can speak from the go ahead uh, is that heather hey hey, hey. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to like be like weirder and just to throw this out there but i mean sometimes when people are about to have a stroke they smell something burning. So I, I, I under I understand the the sensory perception to varying degrees if it be if it whether it be a physical or just a like a mental uh, brain action I mean, responding to some sort of stimuli doesn't necessarily I mean it, it, there are the the variety of events that would cause this some being physical some being spiritual the physical sense is. If, if you are having some sort of a reaction that you are like a smell that you are unaware of, there there might be some sort of like underlying physical thing that's causing that that might warrant investigation. Sometimes it is a spiritual experience, but sometimes it's definitely a very physical response to something like not going quite right in your system. Yeah, and I, I'd like to piggyback on that and, and verify that what she's saying is very accurate, what uh, Ignacio said is very accurate, because um, so the way that they, they look at the actual Eastern science is, is using the Fibonacci, each, each of the uh, Fibonacci numbers corresponding to a different chakra level, and so the way that you're going to experience the world is going to be dependent on where your, your, uh, the main bit of your consciousness uh, this is the the entire concept of the mysterious pass. It's uh, what is guiding you to move. You know, what is the mover behind the moved? And the real you that is that is in there being a very small part in a much larger framework of both visible and invisible um, material. And so this uh, this one place of wherever you are, if you um, if you have a higher energy state, you're going to be in the upper chakras uh, or energy fields. And if you have a lower state, you're going to be in the lower chakras. Uh, one of the greatest indicators of this is if you wake up and you feel more achy uh, and more heavy, then you are deeper into your body, uh, both in terms of surface to, to interior and also from higher to lower, that you are in your lower chakras. And you're going to tend towards uh, the frequencies associated, like, you know, from red to yellow or green even. Um, whereas, and then you're, you're, the way that you filter information is going to be more dependent on how those nerve complexes see that information. And then if you are in a, a higher state and your mind is, say, you're from the throat chakra up, um, 
or even heart chakra if you want, but it, it, especially the higher, whatever you're, you're high, you're going to take the high road in, in arguments. You're going to have higher thoughts. You're going to interpret information from that more ethereal, which case it is ostensibly very possible for you to start smelling um, invisible particles from from the mystical worldview, from from that perspective. Uh, that that you could and and now is it just memory of that particle? I I don't know. You know, I one time I smelled a floor jack from about 200 feet away just by looking at it, and I could smell it as clear as my childhood. But the question is, is that just because the memory, the memory of the of the floor right. jack from then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. and did it hit me? Did it hit me because I was doing tai chi and I just looked over on a deep psychological level? Right, right. Ignacio I've, I've, and I have gone into a little, a, a little bit, just touching on on Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner a little bit, but this super super sensible idea, the things beyond our senses, and, and then being able to tie into them a little bit, and it's really and, interesting. And, and, I, and I think that we have a challenge to discern in today's uh, versatile consciousness what is a spiritual physical event and what is a physical spiritual event i mean well, that's kind of a, it, it, we we should not try to create a separation between the spiritual and the physical that's why they came up with this idea of metaphysical in the sense that there, there is a way in which these, what I would call higher topological dimensions, express themselves in our physiology, and they do so at the molecular and cellular levels, because it's at that scale that high voltage, low amperage events could take place. And whether that's being caused by a, quote, physical uh, particle or whether it is the precipitation of something from a higher topological dimension at a microscopic scale, that's where the huge problem is of trying to discern what sort of creatures are we? How is consciousness uh, uh, to be studied? How is our physical experience to not be limited? <laughs> by a mathematical, materialistic perspective. Right, right. Yeah, I, 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 I do, I totally agree, because uh, I feel very strongly that the yin, the, the taiji, the yin-yang, has, is both self-evident and has been proved out. I, I would challenge anybody to try to disprove it, let's say. And in which case, for everything that's material and visible, there must be a complementary part. And and uh, and I know that that's going to have, especially the materialist reductionists of physics and chemistry, up in arms. But I would just challenge them to prove that there's anything that isn't uh, has a polar complement. I, I just haven't found anything. Um, so I personally take in, the, in uh, take it to be a true law of nature, and in which case, and that that has huge implications. Um, you know. That there is a whole side of us that can be seen. Can I can I ask a couple questions here? Yeah. Two, two questions. One is okay. Well, maybe it's not a real question or like a statement or a wondering is that like my understanding of the term metaphysics just meant outside of physics, so it doesn't necessarily insinuate that it is above anything. It's just outside of it. And in that same respect, the idea that if you're low, if you're vibrating at a lower frequency, that it's going to be centered in your lower chakras is kind of also a misnomer because you can raise the vibration of your base chakra, at which I recommend everyone try. So to, I'm having a hard time I, with, with the whole polarity thing. Of course, that's, that's, that, that makes perfect sense, and, and everything does seem to react within that, within that spectrum within itself, that's basic hermetics. But to say, to, to say specifically, like, this bit, you're, you're, lower, you're, you're suffering from a lower vibration because it's sitting below your heart chakra is kind of adding a, a, like a denotation to your, your gut chakra, your solar plexus, your, your sacral chakra. I mean, all, all of these things can resonate at a very, very high frequency and your crown chakra can be polluted and negative and, and, 
going at a very low frequency. So oh, yeah. I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding like the, how you're, you're, you're describing the metabolism of these frequencies in an association with chakras. I feel like that's like giving those chakras a, a, bad, a bad vibe or a bad kind of uh, denotation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a service to, yeah. your, to your lower chakras, quote, that's, lower chakras. That's a, fair, that's a fair critique. Bear in mind. Um, when you talk about the the average state of things, that doesn't take into account the fractal nature of them, or the uh, the spectrum, or the fact that you could take any correspondence and you can flip it on its head. So you can actually reverse all of the five elements, and they can go the other direction, so that Earth creates fire instead of fire creating Earth. Uh, you can do all that. That's kind of an advanced uh, uh, discussion. Well, it, 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 it reminds me, uh, if you can you can do horrific deeds in your uh, when you ha- when you're in your higher chakras. Oh, absolutely! Just as you can do horrific deeds in, in your lower chakras. Absolutely. And I, I think of creating a spectrum out of it could create create um, more proxy than we need. Um, well, and- the reason it's useful is just so that people uh, start realizing because sometimes one person might be on another floor. And they're they're trying to say the same thing, but one person is yeah. talking out of their yin yang, and the other person is talking out of their heaven heaven man earth, <laughs> and they're trying they're trying to meet, but they're having trouble matching uh, frequency because merely they're seeing through a different filter. It's not that either person's necessarily wrong. I mean, if they're factually wrong, they're factually wrong. But it may be simply that they are today not having the same basic average experience they're they're having and it, and it could be that one of them's going in a forward flow and one of them's going in a reverse flow and that that well, happens too and that can happen between family members and all sorts of situations that create tension that doesn't need to be there it happens all the time um i do have an example of the fractal thing just before i uh in the buddhist uh, alchemy there's something called the three thousand realms in a single moment of life and uh suffice it to say there's 10 worlds, and then there's 10 worlds within those worlds. And it literally, the Buddhists literally meant that even in hell, in the hell state, or the animal state, or the lustful state, that you can have the state of the Buddhas in that frequency, and that it is only a moment's flip away. Uh, and then there was the rest of the times, another 10 times the 3. But the, the important bit is the 10 times the 10, that there is a, a fabric uh, of behavior, and we do tend to see things in a linear spectrum, but it is, of course, uh, uh, multi-dimensional. Mm-hmm. That <clears throat> there's like a, there's a you could see things through so many different frames of reference, like your universal body, and you would act like a different person, and and, um, and then thinking about your experience with your loved ones your friends your family the the e-view you know um and but when you're thinking from this universal body or your godhead or like a larger perspective um it seems that you can see things uh it seems like you're not even your body and you're seeing things larger and it's allowing you to perceive things as, and this is how me speaking as a visionary, I mean, perspective, I guess. Um, but it, it reminded me also of something else you mentioned earlier, where all of our, all of our sensory input is in our reticular formation. And that's at the base of our brain, right? Is that what you were saying? Um, I'm not going to say that all of it is, but I'm going to say that according to biomedical science without the reticular formation you would be probably unable to live because you would be in so because of all of the amount of signals that would be coming in right so it, it really just made me blocks a lot it, of signals it only made me think because if the if the information is coming in our eyes and in our ears and a lot of the time through our mouth that's already in our head um well at least our eyes are already in our head it wouldn't make sense to go back down through the spine to come back up through the reticular formation. But I see what you're saying now, as far as if that was severed, we wouldn't, we would be severed from the body, from the brain connection. Yeah. It's, it's important for us to get away from, um, you know, the front of the head 
versus the enteral. Um, all of the nervous systems are acting, and they're they're both acting for themselves, and they're acting in in cooperation. And especially if you're healthy, then they're acting in cooperation. Um, and and they're the Im interaction between them is really complex, and again probably fractal. There is solid research if people want to watch strolling under the skin, where they actually scope the fascia, and you can watch the fascia deform nonlinearly. And it does have to be wet, just like the Chinese predicted. The the uh, and that's the largest organ of the body, um, by bar none. Is, is the that fascia, interstitial the that was just found? It's it's uh, it is interstitial tissue, um, and, but it's uh, any kind of really connective tissue, which means it's also the tissues inside the cell, all the fibrinogens. They're all interacting under the influence of the same organic uh, principle Collagen. or. Or it, whatever, yeah, it's it's a collagen uh, principle, it's but helical. there's there's something. It's in, a tracheal. Yes, and so this goes to demonstrate again that the wood phase, for example, is not only the liver and gallbladder, or the sympathetic nervous system, but it is in everything because the wood uh, phase of energy is this uh, fibrotic uh, filamentary structuring, and it goes everywhere. I think that the right. yeah. So you can watch this the stretching. The idea that we have that it that our body stretches like a rubber band is totally wrong. And uh, this is a great video. That looks like a rubber band to me. <laughs> yeah, um, got, it's it's somewhere in the middle of the video where you actually watch a water droplet and you can see the changing of the structure and they have all the models. It's beautiful. So it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's healthy, right? When it's not healthy, it doesn't look like that. So pertaining to um, these these extra organelle uh, outside of our bodies, um, is there a bunch of names for them for these channels, these conduits? Um, like when you're astral projecting, is there different names for uh, I guess part of the tissue of the 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 exercise itself? Is I don't know any of this. Oh yeah, I mean it depend. It's all going to depend on which call. If you're learning the most advanced psychology in the world from the Tibetans, it's going to have different names, of course, than the Kabbalistic uh, and, and, and then the Hermetic and the Egyptian. Um, uh, and it's potentially infinite. We don't re – there's no way to put a cap on how many of these systems because uh, the, the Indian channel system does look different than the Chinese channel system. So one thing that I've been wondering very hard for at least the week this past week is – you know the garb that the uh, the ancient Egyptians used to wear, and we know that they used to sun gaze. Is there anyone in, is there anyone in the world that that put together the same garb that they had, with the same side satchel, a little box, and and started staring at the sun? I mean, they had amplifiers on their heads and stuff. It just makes me wonder if anybody's doing this because I can want to try myself. Um, no idea. Um, oh, I I, I'd like to mention that it's not all of the systems that we need to understand. It's the appropriate for our time. That these systems, the the Hindi and the Egyptian and even the lost uh, Hellenistic uh, systems evolved in times that were appropriate for the people there. Uh, that's why they're different. And that we need to discover what is appropriate for our consciousness and the makeup of our physical bodies. Just like we have uniformalism or uniformitism, uh, when we look back at history, we also keep on thinking that we have the same sort of bodies and the same sort of energetic relationships within those bodies. And that is exactly how our consciousness and our subtle vehicles uh, evolve. They, they transform. Uh, nature doesn't repeat itself. We really have to concentrate not I on see a replicating. Lot of, I see a system. lot of repetition, but I, I see a lot of repetition in nature, and, and it's I see cyclical. But as far as uniqueness, I would agree it doesn't repeat on all scales. It's unique. Yeah. So we need well, to pick and choose what we have. What, from what we have, pick and choose what's most applicable from, from first principles and experiential knowledge. I think you, everything is fractal. I mean, honestly, um, when people say, oh, what's fractal? I'm like, what's not fractal? 
Uh, everything can be break, broken down to fractals, which is beautiful. Did you write the solutions on the page? No, you need the pain page when you get your final answers. <laughs> nope, I didn't do that. Sorry, I wasn't writing it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I pressed the mute button. I Make sure it's recursive. Make sure it's recursive. My, <laughs> my son is... So, I'm sorry, I better explain. My, my kids are taking uh, religion and logic. And, okay. and uh, they struggled on their first exam. And uh, uh, they're both doing logic circuits for extra credit. Okay, yeah. And so he, he's offering to hand in his solutions, but I told him he needs to write. I, I hit the mute button, but I guess it had unmuted instead okay. of muted. So <laughs> Nans, Nans and Ans and Nors oh, and Ors and all those. Yeah, all that, yeah, yeah. All that fun stuff. Sorry. All I hear in the background is a baby, so you better not be forcing that baby to do that type of work. That sounds strenuous. No, no the babies, the babies in, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the doctoral program, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you guys shouldn't laugh now, but you should see my, my oldest son's presentation of his uh, skyscraper. He engineered a skyscraper that beat... It beat the spec of a thousand to one weight ratio. Wow! It held. It held. It held my fat butt, and it held. Oh, he it built it too. It, it, oh yeah. Yeah, he did, cool. He designed it in SketchUp, right. and you, you uh, better. He designed it in SketchUp, and then um, we built a test one, and it held 270 pounds and still didn't break. Wow! So nice. serious. We're, it's, it's, I'm, it's not graduate level, but I mean, he he does serious yeah, work. He wow. reads. He reads our paper. He he follows Thunderbolts. He he does all that stuff. Cool. I mean, cool. he, he reads about, yeah, he gets a pretty cool education. Nothing like what I got as a, as a kid, you know. Right, school, right. Public. What do you make it out of? That's like. Uh, I'm sorry? What do you make it out of? What, what do I make? Material? Oh, he made it. It was popsicles. It was, it was uh, popsicle uh -huh. sticks right. and hot glue. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, it was actually pretty strong. Uh, sometime this quarter, they'll do they'll do the uh, mouse trap, and we'll super engineer it. You know, it'll be champion level. Uh, there's a video on that. On <laughs> I think it was Mark Rober. Uh -huh. Mark Rober has a great video on uh, how to make a champion uh, mouse trap derby car. And do the have, physics, have a heart. Right? Do the have a heart mouse trap. Uh, you there's it's not about the mouse trap. To be honest with you, okay. you should watch the video. Mark Rober's video is awesome. It's to, it's all about kinetics and and um, you know just clap. Okay. Okay. And little right. tricks. There's little tips and. Tr right. Yeah, I mean, right. we we do all sorts of weird, crazy stuff. Earlier, we were talking for the religion part. We were talking about the the origin of the concept of demons, because last week we did the origin of the concept of Satan, which is actually a fairly new concept. The origin of the concept of demons, going all the way back to these catastrophic events. So we were discussing the three possible explanations of demons and then where those could be intersecting or creating that 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 uh experience around the world but everybody's interpreting it differently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so anyways that's that's what was going on today okay that's, that's <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, i do agree that things don't uh repeat in the same way they do go around on a on a cycle but there is a kind of a uh, a chaotic bent usually there's a so there's something new around the wheel each time and so yes i i also think that we'll have to create new correspondences but we shouldn't throw any babies out with the bathwater it's, it's, it's been an interesting one that's come in just as far as like kind of like, uh, bits of tension etc but the uh the the just a uh, jim has brought up before like like the you look at the yugas and you look at this very very long cyclic kind of you know uh pattern that you see throughout what, what we can see of history and then but then we're confronted with the catastrophism, you know, the Velikovsky catastrophism, and then the the melding of those two, where you could have you can have this catastrophic, seemingly, absolutely just just something absolutely destroyed, but it comes back into a formation that's that's uh, that's res not necessarily exactly the same, but 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 there is a, a certain base like resolution. Appearance. To, to to the chaos, you know. Yeah, it's, it's someone's. Um, I forget where I heard the analogy, or maybe I even read it out of a book about snowflakes. But it every single snowflake is different um, because of the path that it takes through the sky as it falls down, and that's the same with every human and every atom and everything. I, I believe in molecular uniqueness. Um, that's what I've been shown and I think 
personally, but uh, all the way down because it's the path that it takes, you know. And if and if it's true that that um, pro- protons can't be destroyed, as far as we understand, then my body has you know platypus in it, it has horse, it has dinosaurs, it has all these different bodies and all these different memories from all these different creatures. And I could sit here all day long and try to try to uh, um, uh, evoke all of these past lives through all of these creatures and get all sorts of substance out of each one of them. But what am I doing ultimately at the end of the day? Um, Obviously, exercising muscles that a lot of people don't um, access or access on on the every day. That's like exercising your heart. Your heart needs to be exercised, and people don't talk about that. And what softens the heart? What softens a hard heart? You got to cry. You got to cry. You have to let it out. You have to soften your heart. And I think that that, I don't know if if that's what you, part of what you do, um, Shifu, uh, to get the light illuminating in people's eyes, but. That's what I see when after a good cry, people get that light back in their eyes and, you know, whether it's a, a cry out of penitence or repentance right. or whatever, but well, they get that. Um, to answer your, your latter question, I'm not really doing anything. I'm following both a, a mixture of I, I, my intuition with uh, some, obviously I have formal training. And so there's a little intellect going on, but I try to turn off the scheming mind, pull the person, um, and then I leave, and they do the breathing, and their body does the work. They're the they're the real healers. They heal themselves. Uh, and how how it comes about that will depend on the on the vector, um, and and the etiology of the disease. So for example, I had a woman come in. A really, uh, strange story. Her, so when she walked in, she was vibrating uh, on the etheric level. To an average person, she just looked solid. But to me, she looked if you could plunge your finger into her because she didn't look firm. And um, so we got into the room, and then she opened up. Uh, she had all this that needed to come out. Her son had died from an accidental death touch. And what had happened is he'd gotten in a fight on the high school soccer field and the kid had punched him in the neck and he got what's called internal carotid disintegration syndrome. And within two weeks he was dead because there's, uh, in Western medicine that's an incurable disease. And obviously she wouldn't have known anyone, um, she wouldn't have known anybody that could have cured that. And I, even me, I may not have been able to cure that. Uh, he had been punched in the stomach nine and from there the bad signal propagated and he rotted and, and it entered his brain and he died. And her, response was to go out and have an affair and that ruined run, her marriage run away from it yeah. i'm sorry run, run away escape okay. okay her 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 escape was to go out and have an affair and so um she was there to receive both healing forgiveness to forgive herself and also to have that energy expressed so in her case she did cry but it wasn't a weeping cry like when i needled I had an assistant, and I needled her an LI4, which treats the head, and she burst into tears immediately uh, because she had been praying for her mother to die because her mother had Alzheimer's for so long it was ruining her life. And so, you know, that kind of stuff typically results in weeping and bursting of tears. Um, Me, personally, when I do my meditations, uh, if there's tears or drool comes out, I sometimes don't even know what it came from. Sometimes it's some irritation or whatever is locked in the cheek or locked in the eye, causing you to create a stress line. And you may not even cognize what it is. And, and it really isn't necessarily a, always important to know what it is. Sometimes it's really important because you need to know the etiology to cure it. But in other cases, it's not necessarily um, important. It's just important that it gets expressed. Uh, and on, on some of those occasions, people express it, and they still don't want to talk about it, and then it up because it's important that they talk about. Uh, and that, that's uh, common with uh, rape, sexual abuse, uh, anything like that, where they come in and they have a neck pain, and it's a fight or flight response that is permanently locked in, and they're stress breathing with their accessory muscles of inspiration in their neck, 
and it needs to be talked about. Uh, of course, I have to use the, I have to change with chakra because I, in another room, I might have to be boisterous and outgoing and fun and all this because I got to make a sale too. I can't just be a doctor. Uh, and so when I come back in, I have to totally change modes. Right. And right. That's important for the medicine. Otherwise, uh, you could actually cause damage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's no one in the business who hasn't caused damage. So um, that could cause us a neck sprain just doing that. Right? Having, uh, having, having to switch modes like that. I mean, because they, they're oh, kind of yeah, antithetical, yeah. right? I mean, they, uh, in a way. You know, I mean, yeah. They perceive uh, I've, I've been zapped a few times, if that's what you're uh, asking about. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we keep tap stones in the, in right, the room. Right. You need to be able to tap something and get that charge out of you. Um, there are some really weird stuff that comes in my clinic, man. <laughs> okay. okay. I have a lot of I have a lot of fun, but it's uh it it it, it can be uh really draining. But in her in a in a case like that one um or, you know, I've had several of these with the neck pain caused by past abuse and in male and female. Mm -hmm. Uh it, it that don't, doesn't cause me anything at all because they these people ha are so guarded and their energy is so contained within them that they have a hard time really coming out and affecting other people. Which can be bad for their life too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was I was just just got done watching an episode of uh, uh, Mindfield with Michael Stevens. Uh, have you heard of it? You know, Vsauce, Michael Stevens. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a I, I subscribe to Vsauce, but uh, go ahead and tell me. I don't know if I've seen that. So I just got done watching this episode and it was and a lot basically all of Minefield is uh, psychological studies um, and he's a, he's a psychologist throughout it um, and there's a, a, a thing called neural enhance or uh, neuro enchantment and it's it, it, it completely is built up on and it reminds me of what you keep talking about the, the client comes in and heals themselves you you put the needles in you you put them in this right spot in the meridians wherever they, they go you know your your science there but in, in this episode uh these these kids had severe problems i mean very severe problems and by by giving them a set of false premises uh, and making it look like they were going into an MRI. Uh, this is actually a, there's, they keep doing studies on this. It's a fake MRI machine and they bring people in there and they tell them that they're getting healed and uh, they, they literally get healed. But the whole process of it is you have to make it seem as real as possible. People in lab coats, big machines. Um, and they, a lot of this, they they keep finding that it's placebo over and over and over. Even even uh, fake surgeries or uh, surgeries where they cut you open, they don't do the surgery. People heal. They're healing from things like this, um, and uh, it it just reminds me because they they tell the kids it's it's them that heal. It's you that you're going to heal yourself. And it's only a suggestion with the, that we give you. It's based off of a suggestion. And then they make up their minds that they're going to heal themselves. Um, and this, this even works on dogs, dogs work. Placebo works on dogs. If you give them pills um, for uh, all sorts of different ailments that they have severe ailments that are death life threatening uh, and you replace them with sugar pills, um, the dog continues to heal off of the sugar pills. Um, it, it's mind blowing the whole idea of placebos. I love looking into it and the nocebo too. Yeah, I'm I mean, not saying that your medicine is he, false oh, in know. any way. I, I, but, I, I, you don't worry about it. I've already got the research shows it didn't. But um, right. in our medicine, there is no placebo. The mind is medicine, and so yes. if, if, and if a sugar pill works, then you give them sugar. If the water works, yeah. you give them water. If pinching yep. them on the ear and telling them to look left works, that's what, you know, it's whatever is going to work. Yep. Whatever is going and to work. Somebody... Go ahead. Superstitions could be so real for, and be so um, so, so long-lasting. Well, guys, you know? consciousness is first. 
Perhaps yeah. the placebo is the surgery. The real actual cut the guy open and sew him back up. Meaning that the belief that the physical intervention in the disease cures it is a uh, a belief, a perception. Mm -hmm. If we go out and we use other means that are uh, uh, begin and end in consciousness, the universe is conscious. Yep. And there is the beginning and the end of our existence. For us to distinguish between placebo and non-placebo uh, is uh, uh, making an error of causality. There, or should we say, because it happens in a temporal sequence, we infer causation. Causality is something that comes from above, from whence all of the order emanates and precipitates into the physical environment again we have a limited perception of our multi-dimensional uh, being and we keep on making logical errors of causation because we are convinced that there must be a physical effect cause and effect relationship and we are convinced it must be uh, concurrent or uh, 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 subsequent, but must be uh, follow one to the other in time. And we we rarely, rarely uh, no notice that we are draping the events with our own uh, prejudices. That's why science is so important in the sense of a quality control of thought. When you come down to it, and you are real uh, and consequent with thought. You have. To, I have to uh, agree that I cannot know whether it was a physical intervention or a means of my spirit to enact the change in the physical world, for which I am not, uh, uh, for which I do not have the senses to experience. This is a fundamental problem of consciousness, sensory experience, and logic. It's a fundamental process and a fundamental problem for humanity. A thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, and so much in the future as well. Over. Yeah, to some degree, um, dualism is going to be uh, difficult for humanity because uh, in the law of polarity, you have both the, the complementary aspect and they also do mutually oppose from time to time. So it's very, it is a struggle, I think, on a biological level uh, and a psychological level for us to av avoid uh, separating them. That's why you know, Chinese, they just never, they never saw things in terms of uh, a placebo. But I also, in, t in sticking up for the empirical approach, I think it's important that we do be able to measure uh, some kind of physical change. So it's a, I understand whenever I have, I have a, a doctor, you know, and she just, really has a hard time uh, believing in it, even when she feels the weird stuff. And I understand the, the need for them to have some kind of physical proof or you know, some kind of uh, random controlled trial, double placebo, double blind placebo test. I totally understand it. Um, not all the ways is that appropriate. In fact, especially with acupuncture, you can't really do double blind placebos. And any attempt to just doesn't make any sense because it's intervention therapy. But uh, I think that we could find a balance between the needs of the West and the wisdoms of the East, uh, and that's probably going to be in accepting all the different aspects of the polar law. Uh, sometimes unification and, uh, and avoiding dual dualities is so vital, and in other times, uh, appreciating that there will be a, a, a dichotomy that exists. Some people do need mental health treatment, and if you try to give them pills or... Um, you just tell them go take a jog. It's not just not gonna. It's not gonna work for them, you know. And and it, we call those layers, different layers. And the layers touch, but they are their own layers. You know, uh, this is a psychological problem uh, here in the world. Uh, the suicides and depression and um, Ambien is the number one uh, prescribed drug in the United States here. Uh, and then. I look directly at these things that Michael produces uh, and, and and I see a direct correlation with a lot of the stuff that he talks about. 
and society at the same time. Like take, for example, the nocebo effect where someone uh, tells you that you're feeling pain and then they keep telling you that you're feeling pain and then you, and at first you don't feel it, but then you start feeling it and then and then you start feeling it more and more. The more they suggest that you're feeling pain, the more you're going to feel pain. And this this comes directly from uh, uh, propaganda. The stuff that they the stuff that's on TV and the stuff that uh, is around us, the ads and things like that, they uh, they make us feel bad and by everything, even though there's no pain there, you know, there is pain, but they're telling us, they're telling us that there's pain. They're telling us that there's, uh, and, and by they, I mean, you look at the grand scheme, at least over here in the United States, and you can see why uh, 50 to 55 year old uh, white males are blowing their brains out more than anybody else. Um, suicide used to be more of a, a teen and 20s and 30, 30 year old thing. But it, it, it comes down to a large grand scale nocebo effect. Um, and you can make you can make the whole entire population feel like crap from one orchestrated event or a series of orchestrated events. Um, and then the media continuing to cover cover certain things that just drown you in, and even if you get away don't from you it, you take it, it away from it. But don't you think that that's an internal conflict, and that maybe we're creating that for ourselves? Like it doesn't necessarily yes. have to be the media telling you that you're in pain. If you if you have a, if you have the inkling that you know, like from say some past experience, right? You have some past experience, or some someone else that you know has an experience. Right, that you that you share with them, that you're part of their life while they're having that experience, then that in and of itself is enough to say maybe you know set yourself up for the same experience, the same type of suffering, and that and that maybe it isn't that the that the media is telling us that we should feel this way. I mean, life reflects art, or does art reflect life? I think that it might be rooted more in ourselves and our expression of how we're feeling right now as opposed to some daunting thing out on the outside that's pressuring us to feel this way. Because if we didn't feel this way, we wouldn't allow that. We the only reason I'm blaming it on, on the media. media. Right. The only reason I'm blaming it on the media. It's, it's a reflection of ourselves, is what I'm saying. Okay. I see, I see what you're saying, but the only reason I'm blaming it, blaming it on the media is because it's, and the propaganda is because that's, it, that's what spreads it and that's what people see and that's whether we like it or not it's there and there's happy places all around the world that that don't have propaganda but they're also miserable in certain ways as well um i well, mean we could talk about our crave for uh, sadistic desires as a society the more horrible content that we put out on netflix and these these shows that just fill you with nothing but carnage um, I mean, that can't be a, yeah, but what you see, I mean, bottom line is, bottom line is what you see is what you get. So if you choose to see the same thing differently, you're going to get something different out of it. And they can show us all the same movie and we're all going to see it differently. And so how is that movie? I, I understand the intent of propaganda and why they would build a machine to look that way. But if you choose to look at it differently, it doesn't have to be that way. So what, what I'm, what I guess what I'm saying is just like you said that there was other societies that weren't bombarded with things like this and they were still happy and sad in their own ways. But maybe the reason that they don't allow themselves to be bombarded by this is because it isn't applicable in any way, like relatable to the way they feel. So they don't embrace it as some sort of an expression the way we embrace these quote propaganda because it's something that we feel we need to see or something that validates some feeling that we already feel inside of ourselves. So it's like, oh yeah, this is what it is. So it's accepted and promoted by us. Right. You know Either way, whether, whether I watch the series, whether I watch um, Game of Thrones or not, that I walk by hundreds of people uh, um, daily and drive by them daily, uh, that, that that's a part of their spirit. That's a part of their car. That's a part of their brain. That's a part of their mind field. That's a part of um, uh, their heart, you know? And and whether I watch the crazy shit that's out or not, it's a part of all of our hearts. And that's, you know, the content producer's um, agenda 
comes right back down to who owns it and the money. Well, okay, so I think what you're getting at the heart of uh, this interesting, super fabulous discussion is whether or not you allow your own individual frequency to be modulated by the information that's coming in, whatever the shape of, of the information, however you want to pic picture that, is do you, do you accept it? How are you seeing it? How are you receiving it? Uh, are you letting it pass through you or by you? Is it, is it, are you to it? Are you incapable of attaching to it? You know, it, but it doesn't still have an effect because of some kind of pressure that it puts on either society you or on your family. Um, all of that I think is, uh, going to come out in the wash kind of an average experience is going to really depend a lot on the attitude of the person. Uh, their mental, their mental sail, and how they how they go about seeing the world. There's two wheels on the karma. There's the wheel you steer using the eight laws and uh, the eight spoked wheel, and then there's the wheel that drives over top of you and crushes you. It just depends on whether or not you like to get out in front of uh, things or or kind of let things flow. There's a there's arguments that have been posed in mystic arts from both sides. Uh, and there's even been the argument, of course, that you can't do anything, and so just be a, a drunk, you know. <laughs> that that argument's been posed as well, um, or the God does everything. Yeah, there's, so many, there's so many beautiful reality tunnels, and I love how we can create a brand new one tomorrow. Like, it, it, uh, it often makes me wonder where these folklore come from, and can we start a new Sasquatch uh, or Chibacabra or or legends can how can how do we fabricate a new legend overnight and have everybody just you know, squawk in terror or disbelief or whatever <laughs> well uh obviously there is the the uh big lie told often enough people will start to believe it there there's there's that method but i think it needs to be somewhat organic there, there is something to viral viralicity and there are people who do they, that's what they do for a job, viral marketing. They figured it out. Obviously, the food companies figured it out. They they figured out how to combine marketing, childhood, and chemical receptors to get people. And even if they're even if you're not buying their product, you're gonna buy somebody else's product. And then you, once you eat that product, you're gonna want their product. So they they there are ways to hack uh, this biology and psychology that we have, and 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 do that. Um, I'm I'm personally in the business. This is just me, and it's just my personal, what I want for people of of trying to help people have uh, duh. Um, of course, most people are familiar with Tao, but duh is the personal, actualized uh, experience of of Tao. And well, it, duh. It, it, duh, and it means <laughs> it means empowerment. And of course, it goes right back. The it's a plasma glyph, by the way. Um, nice. And uh, this this concept of uh, of this inner power again is based in the heart. If you read the oldest Taoist text that isn't the one that was on a jade knob, the oldest Taoist text is the Neya. It says very specifically that it's stored in the chest. When you take the vital energy and you store it in the chest, then you have uh, duh. And if you have duh, it says specifically that the animals can't claw you and the people can't harm you and the heavenly disasters can't find you. That's exactly what it says. And that's the that's experience. Smart. That's the Daniel story, right? You know, uh, Daniel in the cave. So, mm -hmm. you know, is that a real reality, or is that, you know, if the person is experiencing Tao at the moment, and then they didn't happen to get eaten by a lion, so then they tell themselves, "Hey, I didn't get eaten by a lion." So I feel, you know, I, right. it's 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 hard to prove or disprove it because it, it may be a completely quantum effect, and maybe in the reality they're sharing. Right there's the the famous saying, "He who knows does not speak, and he who speaks does not know," which really literally means, "He who is in the knowing is not speaking. He who's in the gnosis, and he who is in the knowing will not be speaking." Um, so those people that are enjoying that together, um, how do we find them, and how do we test them for disease and unpleasantries and etc.? I know for me personally, um, I am just dying to be at the wrong place at the wrong time to practice my martial arts and I'm never there. And it's really frustrating. It's really frustrating because when bad things happen to good people, it ticks me off. 
but it yeah. just doesn't. I just never, I just never get to have those experiences. <laughs> so I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have a uh, well. This I would call him an, an acquaintance um, of our group of friends and stuff. Uh, but I, I, I shouldn't even say it. Yeah, he drives out to Flint and goes finds those things, <laughs> those problems himself. <laughs> You know, you 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 want you desire it, but it avoids you because you, it, the universe knows. It's... Yeah, I. Uh, it would be great if mankind spent some time really putting money into researching these topics or researching the changes because how things rotate, but then they they come out different somehow. That's big money. I don't know why we haven't done that as a species, and and I do think it. Uh, I think it's important. Um, obviously there is a lot of money in creating propaganda and, and manipulating people. Um, but you know, hopefully that time will end. I mean, it depends on think, who, you know, yeah. which camp you're in. <laughs> a, it, Some people think it'll end. Right, right. I mean, I think we've been so thick in it that it's, that it's kind of, there's a survival aspect to it. That there's kind of a kickback that's at least, it feels like it's happening. You know? Talk about uh, ge gearing up for... Uh, for uh, a, a little bit of conflict, right? But the, but I think just 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 the fact that the meat, it's, I think it's been true since we've formed. You know, the, the ability to write ultimately so it's been around a long time. But the ability to ma manipulate reality through through that to someone else's advantage, you know, or or the, or the, the author's advantage, or whoever they're working for, their advantage is. I, th I think there's there's a, a a bit of a sea change going on with that. Because it's been so much of it that there has to be a balancing, you know. I would what, do, what do other people think, Ignacio, Heather, Eugene? Do you think that the world is, is changing or do you think that we're going to end up in the same wash kind of huge positives and huge negatives? Well, I think that first let me go to uh, those who heal do not destroy Combat is not for the healers. Either you heal with your chi or you combat with your chi, but they don't mix. And two, the world will always be the mess it is. Those that, that what changes is our, our souls, our minds, our consciousness. We obtain freedom, emotional freedom. We obtain a deeper and wider consciousness. And the more consciousness one has, the more, the less a need for an explanation of process is required. So, for tens or hundreds of thousands of years, this place has been a mess. What changes is us. We move through it onto a higher level. Uh, over. I kind of, can, uh, in a way, completely disagree with that because I feel that destruction is necessary for healing. Because if you if you have some kind of like microbic infestation and in you you want to destroy that to heal yourself if you if you have uh, a cup that's full can't be filled a, a, any of any of those ideas of like a, like something has to be taken out in order for something new to be to be established which means that if something has been destroyed if it hadn't been destroyed there wouldn't be a need for healing and then something else has to be taken out to make room for the new growth so in order for us to develop further, we have to continue to destroy and rebirth, to destruct and reconstruct. And that is part of the never-ending cycle. And it has nothing to do with humanity except that humanity is a part of that cycle. So it isn't ourselves that's destructive and reconstructive. It's just the nature of things. And since we are of nature, it is the nature of us. That's how I feel about that. I don't think it's something we should try to get away from. I think it's something that we should try to and turn the benefits of instead of because there, there's also you, you can overheal something too, and then and then there's no room for growth. Then you hit stagnation. Then maybe something is healed so well that it's taken over an entire thing and it's become the only thing that is in, in turn wiping out diversity, which is destruction. So Do you see I'm what I'm right saying? I wasn't quite nature sure. preserves novelty and and that goes all the way down to um to viruses you know they could be the most novel creatures that we know of i i wasn't well because maybe it's that one thing that oh go ahead sorry i, I wasn't knocking the catabolic and anabolic aspects of nature ramon was talking about beating someone beating someone up with martial arts not 
Right, but there's the spiritual warrior, right? There's the, there's the, there's the art of war. There's a reason for it. If somebody is destroying an entire culture, someone's taken over land that doesn't belong to them, if someone is causing grave injustice, that person, thing, entity, situation must be destroyed in order for the healing to change that you're talking about. So there is, I mean, there, there is spiritual warriors. There is cause for fight for justice. It has its right. role. So when we use this destructive power to adversely affect that it becomes the negative that we associate with it because we yeah. forget that we can use it to heal things too to be to be completely clear i was talking about being in the right place to help someone who's under attack just so that people know what i was talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh not just to yeah. pick some random ass <laughs> no i'm talking about like being on the airplane when it's being right. Right. Yeah. yeah okay all right yeah. so people understand but i completely agree with heather you have to have – you can't have only an allopathic approach. You can't have only a scorched earth approach. You can't Napoleon the world. But you, you, you do need to have um, a complex way of dealing with it. In, in medicine, generally speaking, is a lot of war. But she is also right in that there is – I've noticed if you over-equalize things, that can also be bad because there needs to be uh, – we were talking – somebody mentioned earlier the gradient, that difference of potential – Heather. absolutely important for generating energy and generating uh, the forces of life is there needs to be that potential uh, difference. So it's okay for a, a couple to have fights. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing for the yin-yang to have an opposition as long as we transform it into uh, the next stage, right? And, and, it, and it flows back into the uh, coupling. And I think that that is a totally natural part of life. So, some of it, I mean, the, th the thing that I, it kind of keeps coming to me is, is like, is, there's no co cognization of it. It just kind of, it kind of happens. And that, 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 the ability to let go of being, because I've, I've always been trying to, you know, try to figure out the nuts and bolts of everything and, you know, the, in, in many exotic ways. But it's, it's, it's I, I find the best things these days come out, come out of play. You know, and it's interesting the word recreation. It's recreation. You know, and, I mean, and words, wordplay, and all that kind of stuff. It's like it's approach it like a, like a little kid, you know, and and then it, it it becomes fun, but it can be you know it can be dangerous too. But it's also it seems that we're you know one one of the biggest problems is we're too full of ourselves. I think you let let, let go of it and let it just happen. It's, it's more it's more pleasant. Is that a cop out? <laughs> No, I, I that was I a bit fortune. Spiritual oh, no offense, it was a bit fortune cookie. But that's fine. I know. Sorry. Yeah. Fortune cookies are great. Fortune it's a fortune cookie. I know. I know. I love fortune cookies. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's but but it's it's from someone who ha has gone in and, and like like you know try to try to get some some really exotic superior you know intellectual you know just the model of something, and then and then. Uh, uh, and, and then you, you you wake up and there's like some very simple solution to it that you didn't wasn't even in in, in any, and it's in, always in, a, a, a four letter word love can be but can be, but it's like it's, 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 that's see now I'm gonna go now I'm gonna that sounds like a fortune, fortune cookie, cookie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was the I, argument I, that was I, the that's argument what of the masters that, say that's what that was I'm listen, down to that. There was a master, and he was the first hippie, as far as we can tell. He he, he his name was Master Mo, and Confucius and them couldn't stand him. This man, he was so good. He was so good at defensive arts. He would defend a country, and he would go. To, he would have to flee to that state because the king would be mad at him that he couldn't invade. And then when he showed up, they would lock the gate and keep him out because they were afraid that he would stop them from invading other states. So Master Mo, uh, he was all about that heaven was love, literally love. Yeah, so am I. I, I think it's, 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 it's been stated many times, and it's like I, I yeah. keep on getting too, too. Fortune cookie or no fortune cookie on that one. I think uh, nobody's going to pop that bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been studying the patterns of uh, – uh, I mean, I'm I'm a naturalist, so, and I love watching nature shows. and uh, And I was watching some earlier this week, and I couldn't help but notice that 
the love dance between all creatures has to do typically with the, the brightest color flamingo is the best mate. So then it takes all of the other flamingos um, to have uh, to interpret that pattern, to interpret that as a good thing. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the females that are able to recognize that the, the pinkest one uh, is the mate to go for are the ones that are going to procreate. But then you go to the blue booties, and the blue booties, the, the um, most favored mate is the darkest blue feet. So color, color, intensity of color, and then you go to the, um, the birds of paradise and it's a dance, the greatest dance, you know? And it just, it, it fills my mind with awe and wonder about the dance of love and how, how we all kind of forget that this all comes down to mating, <laughs> you know, we're all like thinking about, and then, and then ultimately mating is the, the mating, mating pairs, which, uh, you know, we, we talk about, but yeah, the mating pairs, uh, of of everything, and and uh, mated pairs of opposing spiral vortices all the way down to the quantum level, but yeah, mating is not love. Love is about something else. Attraction and mating go together, but love goes with uh, taking you know helping the other one reach their highest and truest self. Mm -hmm. Love goes to compassion and goes to the the savvy and the wisdom to uh, not succumb to the other person's problem, but to to find a way that both can become stronger and truer. That's not the same thing as polarity and attraction and repulsion, polarity and mating and procreation, or two different levels of existence. Oh, but it does come down to creativity inside of the uh, individual. Um, because the, the flamingo that's going to have the brightest pink is going to be the most creative because it's going to and uh, be able to reach most likely the, the, uh, the, the strongest reach the waters with the pinkest um, uh, shrimp. And the other ones are going to be like, you know, salmon colored because they're getting it from the gringy water and the, the white, the, the whiter shrimp. And is it true or is it just like somebody's true? This is a fact. Yeah. So, so like you think about this stuff and it's just so strange that it comes down to novelty and then nature preserves novelty. It loves novelty. It tries to keep it and sustain it. And that's what mating is. That's what procreation is, is the sustainability of, uh, of novelty and creativity. Um, because the strongest, the strongest person isn't always as we see it, you know, and as the Disney cartoons paint it, the strong person, like the princess needs the strong, big brute guy, but he might be a little dumb, but hey, that don't matter. Um, now, nowadays, it's the geeks are in style because they're the nerds, because they're the ones reading the books and they're the ones, you know, that, that are ultimately creative and, and running silicon and the banks probably now, but... <laughs> I mean, sorry, my mind meanders. And you're creating your own uh, universe. You're creating your own reality with all of that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that way. You see it that way. And you have to ask yourself whether you're locking yourself to one particular mode of existence because it rhymes you are right now. Well, I, I don't think anybody in here is, is particularly uh, locked in. I've, I've, I've not seen this great concentration of weird dragons in a long time oh cool <laughs> thanks thanks it's probably but, uh, a good time just 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 to just to uh kind of uh keep it uh, less is more but but and just we can kind of what's the right word for it kind of kind of muse and ruminate on everything but uh we could kind of wind it down now and uh, just a, a great conversation post uh, post our our, our little uh, field trip which 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 was wonderful and uh I like your uh, anyway. painting of the dragons, colorful dragons. I'm seeing feathers everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you guys are definitely it, man. I've never. Uh, I mean, I have encountered eclectic groups, 
but uh, not many of them are capable of being hard and soft at the same time. So. Oh, great. Yeah, great. Pretty, We're working good. on it. We're getting better. We, every, you, know, we, we, no, you, guys, you guys are wonderful. Sure. Yeah, you guys are wonderful. Thanks, Thanks you too. That's why yeah. <laughs> part of all that. that's why we're all here, birds of the same feather. There we go. And, yeah, we're all peacocks. And, uh, so look out. They, <laughs> um, I have a bunch of stuff on the news. We can do it on a different episode, but I'm loading it up on some cool stuff. Oh, that, do you? Uh, you want to practice like a little three minute teaser? Uh we could. Yeah, we could do it next. However you feel about it, It'd be funny. Well, maybe yeah. next time. <laughs> okay. Because we're winding down, like you said. Sure. But, okay. Uh, sounds great. Uh, Thunderbird. I just wanted to say we're. I'd Ooh, say we're yeah. Thunderbirds. If you look into that, Native American that Thunderbird. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Let me bring it up real fast. Or th Thunder Nerds. Right? Yeah, Thunder Nerds, Thunderbirds. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that I was one until this lady approached me um, and and told me exactly what was going on, and I was like, "What?" And she's like, "Did something happen when you were 19?" And I'm like what she's like she's like yeah it usually happens in the 19th year of their growth and the geometry came to me when i was 19 mm -hmm. <laughs> in the series of visions so i've been studying them a little bit here and there right right very cool all right so on that